Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby and welcome to the first Telecast of 2024. My guest this week is one of the principal founders of one of the UK's leading independent TV production companies, who's also been in the news quite a lot of late. So welcome to Telecast, Leo Perlman from Fullwell73. How are you doing, Leo? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, it's, it's great for you to join us. Really excited in talking to you about all the things that Fullwell's been up to and what you've been up to recently as well. So let's kick off talking about your background. What we often do on Telecast is you know, get an idea of how people have ended up where they are within the TV industry and how they've got there. So tell us about your career journey, how you've got to be a founding and managing partner of Fullwell 73. It's a great question. And the answer is I'm still not quite sure. I never had any particular ambition or dream to work in the creative industries or in TV and film. I liked television and films growing up, but I never had any intention to work in the industry. So I, I did law at university and knew very quickly I didn't want to be a lawyer. Proceeded to work in a number of different um, capacities, set up a number of businesses, most of which were spectacularly unsuccessful, and then pretty much fell into the idea for a TV show. The only people I knew who worked even tangentially to television were my two cousins, Ben and Gabe Turner. Ben at the time was editing B-roll for television adverts, and Gabe was at university, and I remembered that he was doing American studies with a module in film. So as far as I was concerned, those two were the experts in the field. So when this opportunity fell into my lap to, to make a TV show, which is a long story, they were the first two I called. They had an old friend from childhood called Ben Winston, who was doing the BBC course at Leeds at the time. So with that dream team, we went ahead and made our first TV show. Right. Okay. And originally, and we'll talk a little bit about where Full Well 73, where the name comes from. And obviously you're very inextricably linked with Sunderland. Sure. But was it, are you originally from Sunderland? Yeah, I was born in Sunderland, grew up in Newcastle, left the Northeast when I was 18. So yes, from the region. And so when you met your founders and mm. started working with them on a professional level, how old were you then? 2003. I, I was born in 79. I don't know how old that makes me, whatever right. it was. Okay. <laughs> but I'd done a few things until that point. But as yeah. I said, none of them in none of them in television or film. And what was that first production? Uh, it was called The Freestyle Show. It was kind of like Wayne's World, but for sport, but with none of the humour um, of Wayne's World right. whatsoever. None of the intelligence either. Uh, but amazing learning experience of how absolutely not to do things. Yeah, in fact, one, one great story uh, just to share um, of just how, just how bad a show it was. Um, we used to shoot it on a Saturday and Sunday morning. It was a live, of all things, kids TV show presented by football, basketball freestylers, kids, talented kids, but from the streets who had no formal training themselves, so much like us. And the four of us would rotate the roles on a weekly basis. So one of us would be the vision mixer, one of us would operate the camera, one of us would be the producer, one of us would be the director, because we were all learning, you know, as we went along. And one particular show I was directing, whatever that means, and we went to an ad break and I went onto the set and I started berating our young presenters. I was like, where's the energy? It's a fucking joke. I don't know what you bothered to turn up for this week. I was really losing it. And my phone is buzzing in my pocket and everyone knows one air. So I take my phone back. It's my mum. Put my phone back in my pocket, continue to berate them. It rings again. It rings three times. Eventually on the third ring, I pick it up. I'm like, mum, we're on air. And she goes, I know. I was like, so why are you calling me? She goes, no, you're on air. <laughs> I was like, you. what do you mean? Because you haven't gone to the ad break. Right. That is probably, that, and that, that's not like the worst example. It just shows just how appalling the television show we made was. But what that led to was in the hands of the gods. So one of the young presenters, a guy called Paul Wood, he had a dream to meet Diego Maradona. And he had uh, no money to do so when he came to us and he said, I want to busk my way from London to Buenos Aires to meet Diego Maradona. It'll be my life's dream to do so. Would you follow me with cameras? And after much persuasion, and he had a group of, you know, boys who wanted to go along on this journey, none of whom had a 
penny between them, didn't have passports, let alone any money to do so. We went to the BFI, whoever it was at the time, and we got a bit of money and we raised some money. We raised about a hundred grand all together from friends and family. And we went on this adventure together with these five boys, the four of us and a little crew. And that resulted in the first film we ever made that went to Cannes. And, and to be clear, when we made it, it really was, you know, if the idea that it was in one cinema, if the idea that it ended up on any channel anywhere in the world on television and that we didn't lose money, that would have been a success. It ended up going to Cannes, being bought by Lionsgate in a very surreal bidding war where we were taken to parties and told all kinds of wonderful things about ourselves and released on 80 screens, which was the widest release documentary ever at the time theatrically in the UK. And we stood there on the green AstroTurf carpet at Leicester Square at the premiere. We had asked for a green AstroTurf carpet because it felt like we could ask for really ridiculous things at the time. And it turned out we could. And we kind of sat there and looked at each other and we were like, we should, we should do this for a living. Why don't we set up a company? Quite naive. 24 hours later, when no one had been to see the film, and it was pulled from those 80 screens, we were left with still this plan to set up a production company. But of course, no one interested in commissioning anything from us. So that was the birth of Full World. Well, I mean, learning on the job, right? And Absolutely. And still am, no doubt about it. Yeah. But those shows, there, there obviously is a strand running through those that, that leads right up to now in terms of, you know, a lot of football. Lot oh, thank of God, I thought you were going to say they were bad. I was really <laughs> worrying that's where you go, Justin. Well, let's talk about some of your shows. Let's talk about, I mean, it's an incredible list of of credits, the Kardashians, Late Late Show with James Corden, who's obviously also a, a partner of yep. the business. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Some of the specials that you've done in terms of music are remarkable as well in terms of uh, a lot of people have seen the Adele shows both for, I think it was CBS, was it, in the States and also ITV yep. in the UK around her uh, recent album launch. Um, One Direction shows, the Grammys, and then Sunderland Till I Die, which has been you know, a big hit on Netflix. And so that's what I mean about that sort of thread running through it, the football and the entertainment. Mm -hmm. And also feature docs. And uh, a lot of those have th been theatrically released as well. Obviously, a, a lot of success in the States that you've had. What built that momentum towards going to the States? Because... UK indies, that's, you know, often the dream is mm -hmm. to go into the biggest TV market in the world after you've proved yourself in the UK and and obviously got some great commissions with with broadcasters. And presumably some of this was almost pre-streaming or sort of pre-the modern streaming era, let's say. So what led you to opening an office in LA and having success in the States? What was what were the steps that you think that led you to crossing the Atlantic? Well, going back to the point you made earlier about the, I guess, the theme that runs through a lot of the content, I think in that early phase of Full World, when we were building, the theme that ran through it was really our talent relationships. And those are absolutely not down to me. My partners are the most brilliant creatives, but also they build relationships with talent in a way that I've never seen anywhere across our industry the like of. And by that, I mean... They are genuinely interested in having a relationship, a genuine relationship, a friendship with these people. These people, normal people, but happen to be great talent. Yeah, but isn't it Whether it's it's, a business relationship? Isn't it really? I mean, obviously no, it is. And that's, but... and that's the difference. The reason why talent so often want to work with Full World, and in particular so often want to work with Ben, Gabe and Ben, they don't want to work with me at all. I'm the guy who has to go and negotiate a deal or whatever. The last person they want to be in a room with is me. But with Ben, Gabe and Ben, they absolutely want to come back time and again because they believe, and they're right, that Ben, Gabe and Ben have their best interests at heart, that the content they're going to create together as a partnership is going to be genuine. It's going to be honest. It's going to lean into what they think is important about how they're presented. And so there is a real genuine friendship that underpins it. It's incredible how they're on such good terms, how they hang out, how they or on WhatsApp groups with all of these people they work with once and the next thing you know, they're best mates. That isn't contrived in order to get work somewhere down the line. That's not how it works. It's because they really enjoy spending time with them. And I think that's what's underpinned the success or certainly underpinned the early phases of the success. I go back to James Corden as the perfect example. James and Ben met on the set of Teachers, 
when James was 16 or 17 and Ben was 14 or 15, and they were effectively at a kind of similar stage in their careers. Ben was a runner on the show. James was a bit part in the show, small part in, the, in, in Teachers. And they recognized something in one another. They recognized an ambition. They recognized a desire to be successful in the industry. They recognized a similar, I guess, tonality to the kind of content they enjoyed. And they just became best mates. And that led to James working with Fullwell as we move forward. Smithy sketches around the England team as a first example. That was the first time I ever worked with James. And then right the way through up to the late show and the Gavin and Stacey Christmas special and the huge piece of content and eventually him becoming a partner in the business. But if James is the ultimate expression of that relationship that my partners have with talent, those other relationships, whether it's with David Beckham, whether it's with Jack Whitehall and a whole host of others that I can list, Trevor Noah, the guys from One Direction, but in particular, Harry, that James example is the ultimate example of it, but all of those are very similar. So I think the initial theme that ran through our content was talent trusted us. Talent trusted us to do right by them. And we did over and over again. And we delivered content that was genuine and that they loved and they enjoyed working with us. And that's what the business was built upon. No doubt about it. It's interesting you say the Smithy sketch around the England team because, mm. you know, some some of those moments that, that also you've mentioned have become real highlights of recent you know, television. When it comes to James, was the commissioning of The Late Late Show with James, was that the first major project that you had in the States or was that because presumably as director of the business he said yes I'll do the show but we have to produce it is that how that worked? well the show was the rationale for opening an office in the US it was the reason why Ben moved out there to set up the US office we wouldn't have set up a US office at that point it was always the intention in terms of James I mean look you know I think James has said himself a number of times so I feel comfortable saying it as well when he was asked to host the Late Late Show, he was as surprised as anyone else. And it was, you know, incredible credit to CBS in seeing James as potential talent, which, by the way, is no surprise to us. He's the most frustrating partner in that he's just so fucking good at everything. As in, like, he can write, he can dance, he can sing, he can act, he can do a monologue. You know, he can produce brilliantly. He's got such an eye for creative detail. It's really frustrating to have someone that good. But, joking aside, when he was asked to do the show, the caveat that he gave CBS, which is insane to look back on now, was that, and he wasn't a partner at Full World at the time, was that, well, I'll only do it if Full World 73 produced the show. And quite rightly, CBS said, I have no idea who you're talking about. And he said, oh, they're the guys who, and he listed a few things we'd done, and they went, I have no idea who you're talking about. Ben uh, and the team went out there and effectively pitched for their involvement, for our involvement. CBS Let's be honest, because they were so desperate for James to do the show, not because they were enthralled with the idea of Fullwell doing it, said, sure. And the guys moved out there with, I think, a very, an, again, a very short-term realistic view. Eh, if we're on air for six weeks, happy days. If we're on air for six months, even better. The fact that it was, you know, ended up being eight years and we ended up choosing to end the show, which is incredibly rare. I mean, normally you're kicked off. And instead, we were offered three more years and decided that it wasn't quite the right decision at that time. And we had other ambitions and we'd done everything we could do with that show. It's just an incredible testament to how brilliant uh, a job they did on that show. But that was the driving force behind opening the US office. And then the business out there has built off the back of that, no doubt about it. That must have been a really uh, high pressure time, I suppose, when you were going out there and pitching for your involvement, like you're saying, into that show, because you can imagine, or I can imagine, there'd been some pretty hard-nosed American TV execs not wanting a UK indie to, to produce this, really wanting their, somebody that they knew and trusted and worked with all the time doing that. So, so, But it's a free hit. It's a free hit. There's no pressure when it comes to something that you don't expect to be offered and certainly don't expect to get. And actually, I think that's not a terrible attitude to take more generally. You know, you can never become complacent or think that you're entitled to anything, deserving of anything. When we got to make, you know, Captains, the Captain of the World, the show that was just released on Netflix over Christmas, when you get offered the chance, when you offer the chance, when you win the chance to make the official World Cup series that's never been done before, access to all the captains of the World Cup, 
as many cameras as you want floating around a World Cup in every dressing room, etc., and for it to be on Netflix. That isn't a right. That's a privilege. So every single time we get to do something like this, that's how we view it. It's a bit of a free hit. I mean, it changes when you've got lots of people that rely upon you to keep on turning over a certain amount to pay the bills and keep the lights on. And of course, there's more pressure at that point. But if you ever change the attitude that it's something that's your owed, then I think that changes everything about the way you approach it. The Late Late Show was a free hit. It was a free hit when we got it. It was a free hit for the first season of it. And then it becomes more serious. But most shows are like that for us. Look at the Kardashians. We'd never made a reality show before we made the Kardashians. And then you get to make the biggest one on the planet. Of course, there's a massive pressure to that, but it also gives you a freedom. And again, what the team did in reimagining a show that had been on air for 20 years and had become truly iconic and everyone knew exactly what they were going to see week in, week out. And then to have to deliver that brand new show and that opening segment, the opening piece of that new series had to feel different. It had to feel same characters, but it had to feel like something you'd never seen before, even though there'd been a thousand episodes previously. That's a free hit. So you talk about your partners and their ability to work with talent and build relationships with talent. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to creativity then, and the creativity needed to reboot a show like the Kardashians, and also to come up with all of these new developed new developments and all of these really successful shows that you've developed. Who's the creative force within Full World 73? Do you, is there one person that, that really leads that? No, that there's not one person. There's a team. There's an amazing team based across the US and the UK. It truly is a transatlantic company now. We're very much aligned between US and UK, mainly because we sell most of our content to global buyers. US studios. Certainly, we still sell to the UK, but the size of the market just dictates that. So no, it is a a team of people. And to start naming them would genuinely mean naming a host. We have an incredible exec team at Fullwell. We have, I believe, some of the best creators in the industry working at Fullwell. It is very much a collaborative effort on every occasion. And is the business truly independent, a true indie? Or do you have investment from any distribution businesses? True or? indie. No investment from any distribution business, any broadcaster, streamer, studio. No, none whatsoever. And is that something that you're keen to maintain? Look, the industry is changing so much on a day-to-day basis, let alone week or month to month, that who knows what the future holds? And I genuinely mean that. I think that the last few years, certainly going back to slightly pre-pandemic and through to now, has been chaotic for the industry, chaotic for broadcasters, streamers, major indies, minor, for all of us. You have to remain flexible. You have to take a view that you're not quite sure what's around the corner, but you also have to embrace that and not be afraid of that. Because where there is chaos, there's also opportunity. And I think that's how we that's how we view it. Certainly, you know, certainly if we look at what Full World was pre-pandemic, you could have definitely described us, I would say, as a transatlantic production company. We made TV and film. That's what we did. The next iteration of truly successful companies within this space, I think if they were to describe themselves as transatlantic production companies in three to five years, probably don't exist. And if they do, they're a tiny proportion of the size of most that exist now. I think the future for us, and I'm not telling anyone else how to run their business, but I think the future for us is thinking ourselves about ourselves as a global content company. The difference being that one can't just look at the two key markets that have built our business, US and UK. You have to look further afield. We're already starting to do so, but we certainly haven't done it enough yet. One have to think about content far outside traditional production, certainly outside of traditional TV and film. The places where content is viewed, as we've seen over the last few years, and this is no, this isn't an update for anyone, uh, are becoming more and more diverse. And I think we just have to be open to that change and that shift. That's certainly the way that we're looking at it. Does that mean in practice that you may be looking to create original productions for that, that live on social channels that you can build and actually start interacting with the audiences and, and managing audiences yourself? I think direct to the consumer and cutting out as many of those layers as possible is a 
key part of the future. Uh, I don't think it's the only part. I think that as long as you operate in the creative industry, you need major calling card pieces of production that sit at the center of your wheelhouse. So you have to be making the Kardashians. You have to be making a friend special. You have to be doing something about the World Cup, an Elton John special, an Adele special, the Grammys, etc. You have to be doing stuff that still sits at the nexus of all these traditional places. You have to. But what you can create around that and the additional experiences that you can create off that, that's where the growth, I think, for the industry lies. That's, I think, where the growth for Full World lies. Immersive and experiential is becoming more and more important. We've only scratched the surface in that regard. Full World certainly only scratched the surface, but I think the industry as a whole have only done so. That's certainly a big growth area for us moving forward. Direct to consumer, how do we speak to the consumer without the layers in place? Certainly again. Reaching fandoms, engaging with fandoms, deepening and broadening that engagement. So, you know, there is no such thing anymore really as that water cooler moment. Because even a piece of content that is incredibly successful is still only watched by a tiny proportion of the population. So you don't have those moments now where everyone is tuning in. Of course you don't at a certain time, at a certain place to watch and consume. It just doesn't happen. But the fan bases are rabid for the content that they love. So how do you reach them? And how do you give them a piece of content that extends their experience beyond what they could have hoped for? The Friends one is a perfect example. You know, I think fans of Friends were desperate for something more. And the way that we reimagined what a reunion could look and feel like was something that deepened and broadened that engagement. There's a lot of there's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities out there, but they don't exist, I don't think, in as much in the traditional space as they have previously. Talking about the pandemic, I'm not going to dwell on that, but the change that it's affected mm. in the industry that we're really starting to feel now, and you as a, as you say, transatlantic content production business, I mean, the year that we've just had with strikes with cost of living crisis, with uh, all of these macro effects that we're now seeing that the you know, first working day of the new year, Channel 4, cutting 20% of their staff, we can only expect that actually to continue, I think, in many other production, broadcast and, and perhaps streaming businesses going mm -hmm. forward. Well, Amazon similarly. Yeah, that's right. Amazon as well. And it, it you know, it's not going to be a surprise uh, when those stories hit. How are you preparing for this year then and 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 how have you negotiated last year because presumably when you were in 2022 looking ahead to 23 particularly in the states which i would imagine is one of the main that your biggest office that in terms of the, the the productions that go through the business presumably you couldn't see 2023 coming and what would what happened last year how are you preparing for 2024 and beyond because you know, the, one of the phrases that I started to hear last year was survive until 25 mm -hmm. in terms of producers. Is that the way that you see the business? Is it just a case of, you know, circle the wagons and let's stay and stay as successful as we can be despite what's going on? Or, you know, what's your approach then to, to this year? I don't want to suggest in any way that we had a crystal ball because we didn't. I also would say that anyone who says they didn't see the strikes coming was being naively optimistic about the direction of travel. I do think that the strikes were predictable. I do think that there were significant indications from the market that scripted television was not going to enjoy quite the same level of investment that it had previously. I think the noises coming out of the major streamers suggested that as well, which, by the way, as a caveat, anyone who's been in this industry for more than 10 years, let's say, shouldn't really be complaining about the fact that, you know, a streamer is talking about spending nine rather than 11 billion, because not that long ago, there was no nine billion to access. That's not to say that it's not hard to, you know, to recalibrate, but at the same time, us included, we've all, we're all a little bit guilty of having been slightly greedy and lazy and got a little fat from enjoying all of those 
huge fees that came out of the streamers over a number of years while they tried to establish themselves against one another in the market, to a point where they were trying to overpay against each other just to make the statement of how much money they had. We all enjoyed it. We all loved it. But some of us took our eye off the ball with regard to what was really important in our industry, and that's ownership, IP, format creation. And I think we're to a degree, we're suffering off the back of that now. So while I think 23 was really tough for the industry, tough for everyone, a complete wipeout for scripted, obviously, I think 24 is going to be incredibly hard, harder than 23, actually. I also think that amongst all that chaos, there does exist opportunity. You've just got to work really hard to both find it and to realize it. So to a degree, I think you're right. It is about circling the wagons, but it's about circling the wagons in a positive manner. It's not quite as defensive as you might make it sound. I actually think it's trying to be positive and look for where the opportunities are going to emerge. So again, I'm not giving away any secrets. Immersive and experiential is a whole new universe. It's a whole new world out there. Lots of people are going to waste a lot of money and make mistakes in that space. I hope we're not one of them. But a lot of people are also going to make a lot of money and be very successful in that space. And the reason why immersive and experiential is opening up in the way it is, is to some degree off the back of the pandemic, to some degree because the theatrical experience has diminished so greatly. So people have to be encouraged and have to find another, a better reason to get someone off their couch. But I do think there are opportunities out there. The challenge is in traditional content. The opportunity is in the newer, the new world out there. When you say immersive content, are we talking about, for example, the Van Gogh exhibitions that are immersive experiences and the Tom Hanks-led exhibition that's happening in the Lightroom in London, which is all the Apollo 11 content that makes you feel like you're on the moon. Yeah. So looking at your real areas of strength, which is music, which is entertainment, which is sport, mm-hmm. so we might see that sort of content in terms of a live experience coming from Full Well 73 in the, in the future. Again, I don't know which direction it will take us, but certainly we would look to lean into our core and where our core competency and relationships lie. I think we've already seen a couple of examples of sporting immersive experiences here in the UK. There was a, a tennis one based around a famous Wimbledon match. There was a boxing one, which was on just before Christmas. So there's already been a few touch points around that. In music, again, ABBA is the ultimate, ultimate expression of the immersive music experience. I hate ABBA, but that experience is absolutely astounding. astounding. I hate ABBA. I've never heard anybody say those three words before. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, don't hate me for it, but I, <laughs> yes, can't stand them. But I thought, the, but the show itself is astounding, absolutely astounding. So I think there are already pointers to how it can be done. And in that respect, done fantastically well. And it's been incredibly successful and rightly so. So yeah, I think there are real significant opportunities in those spaces. And the examples you gave as well, I think are really good ones because what's so important, no matter what platform, and I include the immersive space as a platform, no matter what platform you create content for, it should be, by, by my reckoning, the best place to put that content. So the Van Gogh experience is so brilliant because there is no other way of experiencing that. The Tom Hanks Apollo 11 experience is because there is no better way of experiencing that. There is a documentary you can watch, and that's great. And a very beautifully made, crafted documentary on exactly the same story can be watched in your living room. But that experience can only be enjoyed in that immersive way. So I think as long as we don't, you know, we don't kill this by force feeding people bad examples of it, which one can argue has been the death knell of a couple of other areas of potential in our industry, then I think there's a, there's quite a significant future for it. Interesting. And and at the centre of that is IP. The, and, and that's really going to be the change, isn't it, when it comes to less and less global deals being done and more and more opportunity to own your IP and distribute your own content and build this We've talked about this on Telecast a few times, octopus strategy, where you actually have this IP in the centre, 
mm-hmm. and it might be, as you say, documentary, scripted, immersive, short form, all of these pieces of content actually coming from the central IP, which you own as a business. And that is, sounds to me like the direction of travel that you're going in. Well, it's summed up by this. Yeah. It's thinking about your core business as an incubator for all of the other opportunities, which in very, in, in, is, the Late Late Show is actually a perfect example of that. The fact that Late Late Show was on four nights a week and 40 weeks of the year, or God knows what those guys did, incredible, meant that you could use it as an incubator. The show itself, obviously fantastic, had to be hugely entertaining, but all of those little bits that were on the show, that was an opportunity to throw ideas at a wall and see what the response was almost instantaneously through the YouTube channel. So the success of Carpool Karaoke, obviously, comes off the back of the Late Late Show acting as an incubator or drop the mic or the lineup. You know, these are examples of shows that hit as little mini bits and then we developed out. Um, mini um, format development, actually. Exactly. It's an incubator. And if you think about Carpool Karaoke, which was a success, first off, you know, five, six, seven years ago, now, think about the immersive experience one could do around Carpool Karaoke. Think about all of the other tangential pieces that one could look at. So I think that's the way we think about core content as a, as a starting point for all those other pieces. In my introduction, Leo, we talked about you've been in the news recently for a number of different things. And we'll come on to talk about Sunderland and, and your plans for Sunderland, which are really exciting. But let's talk, first of all, about the rise of anti-Semitism within the TV industry that you've seen. You've been really vocal on this in terms of on social media and also within broadcast, because I know you wrote an article which was in response to an anonymous piece that was written. And uh, you pulled that uh, original writer up on, I think, four or five different key points that they listed. Where do you think this anti-Semitism is, I mean, is coming from? I mean, I mean, it's an extraordinary, you know, reaction to obviously, you know, the tragic events that happened in, in October in Israel and that are still ongoing right now, that anybody in their right mind is obviously, you know, abhors any type of suffering. But we've seen, you know, we've seen this extraordinary divergence of opinions. Taking you back to that original article and your response to it, have you come across that person? Do you know who that person is now? Because it was an anonymous piece. No, I have no idea. But I just wanted to start with your first point. And I'm very glad you asked me about this. It's not that there has been an exponential rise of anti-Semitism within our industry. There's been an exponential rise of anti-Semitism across society. A greater rise than since statistics started being drawn up on this. Quite incredible numbers. 1,350% increase across London. Over 50 cases of anti-Semitism documented, let alone those that aren't, on a daily basis since October 7th. It's absolutely off the charts. And the Jewish community is genuinely in fear. My kids go to a Jewish school and, you know, a lot of parents didn't send them into school for the first for the first few weeks post-October 7th. My kids couldn't play outdoors in the playground because the school couldn't guarantee their safety because of the threats being dialed in. Graffiti around the area where we live, smashed windows, etc. There's, there's a long list. The creative industries, film and TV, are not any different from any other part of society. So alongside that rise across society, we've seen the rise within our industry. I guess what frustrates me, angers me, saddens me so much, is that our industry is so good at standing up for and speaking out on behalf of minorities who, where they see, where they see racism. And it makes me incredibly proud, or has done until this point, that we always do as an industry, whether it's through voices, strong voices, talent, on screen, off screen, whether it's through bodies that operate within our industry, whether it's through content that we create that acts as a soft power to inform people. When you see quite the opposite, when you see something quite insidious, when you see that anti-Jewish racism seems to be the acceptable racism within our industry, that people are still comfortable espousing, it causes you to step back and think and forces you to stand up and call it out. 
I would say that the second most, the second oldest, second most infamous anti-Semitic trope is one about Jews controlling the media, Jewish power within the media. And I think back over the 20 years I've been in this industry, the number of times people have made jokes about that and I've let it go. Made a joke about it and I've kind of gone, ha, ha, you know. The truth is that the reason why that particular trope is so insidious and so clever is that it makes Jewish people within our industry not speak out for fear of perpetuating the trope. So a made-up trope is one that is forcing Jewish people to keep quiet, which makes it all the more important that those of us within the industry who feel comfortable enough or are in a position um, where they can need to stand up and speak out, which is why I responded to the anonymous article in broadcast, which is why I've called out uh, publicly the anti-Semitism where I've seen it, whether it's equity whether it's actions or, or failure to act on the part of the BBC, whether it's a certain agency that I think handled a particular very senior agent very badly. There are a huge number of examples. And it, it's exhausting and it's really sad that we have to do so. And you produced the Stephen Fry alternative Christmas speech yeah. on, on Christmas Day. And going back to what you were saying about soft power and the and the ability to for broadcasters and producers to address you know that sort of anti anti semitism and, and those sort of issues that Stephen Fry did so well mm. on that broadcast that still came in for some criticism, didn't it? I mean, which is extraordinary. I actually think that the Stephen Fry example you bring up is is the absolutely perfect one. First off, credit to Channel Four for, and it's really sad to say, for having the courage to allow a Jew to say that there's a lot of anti-Semitism out there. Should we try and curb it? The idea that anyone has to be labelled brave for doing that is sad in itself. The fact that Stephen spoke in the way he did, with the courage in the way he did, and the words that he used, which I'm not sure all of the people who criticised it so, so appallingly actually had listened to, the level of criticism that he came in for, the level of like real vitriol that was aimed in his direction, at Channel 4's direction, at Fullwell's direction, was the proof of just how necessary it was. That wasn't an appeal that had anything to do with Israel or Gaza or the terrible loss of life on both sides, innocent loss of life on both sides, that no one wants to see. What we all want is a lasting peace, a meaningful lasting peace. Our belief in how we best get there may differ, but that's the result we all want to come from this. No doubt about it. But the fact that a Jew simply saying we are suffering as a community against a factual increase of anti-Semitism that outstrips anything we have seen ever in our past before, and that met with such vitriol and hatred was really proof positive of why it was needed. Let's move on to something more positive. Some of the articles that I read over the Christmas period were around your crusade to build Sunderland as a the Hollywood of the North, if you like, and really invigorate this great city, which has obviously suffered as many northeastern cities and many in the North have suffered over the last 20, 30 years no when it comes to recession, deprivation and lack of investment. Tell us about your plan and ambition then to, to kickstart Sunderland as this new centre of TV and film. The starting point of this is that the plan initially was never for it to be Sunderland. I have to be honest about that. The thesis was that between North Yorkshire and Glasgow, there was effectively this black hole, this land that television had forgotten, where growing up, there was so much amazing British content that was produced out of that area, 300 miles. And since, in truth, very little, and yet innumerable high-end television and feature films were shot across that space. Productions with budgets of hundreds of millions, but they would come on location and then leave. And they would take their money and their crews and all of their expertise with them. And that's because there was no studio for them to base themselves. What we saw was that the UK had done a fantastic job in partnership between public and private of building a studio business worth now 6.7, 6.8 billion dollars a year of incoming GVA off the back of the UK tax credit 
uh, and the legacy studios that effectively London and the Southeast provided. And we'd seen other areas around the UK develop studios, but not necessarily really deep-seated infrastructures. And so there'd be a few stages and they would get a fantastic production. And in some cases, like Northern Ireland, a whole years of production. But yet still, they didn't become a second major production hub. London and the Southeast, and then lots of disparate pieces. So when we looked at the initial opportunity, the thesis was the UK needs a second major production hub. The UK needs an Atlanta, Georgia. 20 years ago, Atlanta, Georgia was known for sport and music, certainly not for TV and film production. Off the back of the Georgian tax credit, and three or four producers, Tyler Perry included, seeing the opportunity to build an infrastructure there from scratch, they have since created the second largest production hub in the US. Remarkable. So we said, that's what the UK needs. No doubt about it. That $6.7 billion of incoming, the blink of an eye, could be nine or 10, certainly enough business out there for it to do so. Or it could be two or three if we don't take the opportunity. Because London and the Southeast is saturated. It's very expensive. There aren't enough crews. And they're all plans to alleviate those problems. But there's more than enough to go around. There's more than enough for there to be a second major production hub and for London and the Southeast to still be packed out, packed to the rafters. So when we started looking at locations, it was across that entire area. The fact is, Sunderland City Council was simply the most ambitious, entrepreneurial and commercially minded council that we spoke to. So it ended up being in Sunderland. In truth, because of our connections to Sunderland, we wanted it somewhere in the Northeast region because it's a regional play. It's not a Sunderland play. It's absolutely about the Northeast as a region and then exponentially greater for the UK as a whole. But it is in Sunderland, uh, which means I get to go to football regularly. So that's no bad thing. Uh, it's on this incredible brownfield site right on the banks of the River Weir. The plan is for 1.8 million square feet, 20 sound stages to create 8,500 new jobs, uh, 350 million of annual GVA into the region but 2.5 billion into the UK as a whole and 21,000 jobs for the whole country. Mm. So this is not a binary play. It's very crucial that we make the point. It's not about taking business away from London and the South East or any other region. It's about adding to that 6.7 billion. It's about ensuring that we go from 6.7 to 9 or 10 and not 6.7 to 2 or 3. When it comes to studio capacity, uh, which is obviously a study you must have gone into in, mm. in great detail. Yeah. Now we're at the end of the, I think, <laughs> the golden scripted commissioning era that's behind us. That, and we saw when we were coming out of lockdown, certainly when we're coming out of lockdown too, a huge set of announcements across, as you say, the southeast of new studios that were being built in Hertfordshire. And, and we've seen the new Sky Studios, which I think has got about 14 sound stages. So the ambition of yours is even bigger than that Comcast play that's, that's happened in Elstree. Well, I have to whisper the fact that 20 sound stages, I'm often told, don't talk about the bigger plan because then people really think you're crazy. But 20 sound stages is just the start. So yes, that's this first effective build, but the plan is for it to be far greater than that even. Is it the demand for that space? Because if there's going to be less productions... Do you know where the second largest production hub in Europe is? After London and the South East? No. you think somewhere in the UK, right? And we've got such a head start on everywhere else. Budapest. That's really quite incredible to think that Budapest, Hungary, which has no history whatsoever of production, have built the second largest production hub pretty much in the space of five to seven years from a standing start and has overtaken any, anywhere else in the UK after London and the South East. Now, why is that? It's because we have focused all of our attention on London and the South East. And rightly so, those heritage, those incredible heritage studios, I've shot at Pinewood, it's amazing. They should be there, they should develop, they should keep investing in their space and capacity and they will be full no matter what. But if we're going to take that 6.7 billion up to the 9 or 10 or 11 even that this country fully deserves, then it has to be based on building that second major production hub. And there is no reason whatsoever why it shouldn't be the Northeast. The Northeast has been known 
for decades uh, as a centre for industry, certainly in coal mining industry, the shipbuilding industry. In 10 years' time, the dream is that people will talk about the Northeast as a hub for creative industry. And I think there's every chance that we achieve that. I would also say that post the strikes, the data that we're receiving from largely the owners of the studios and the stages is that the UK is once again outstripping anywhere else in Europe as a nation for the number of bookings, the inquiries, the huge demand again. So you're absolutely right. Peak TV, yes, we're on the other side of it. But I said earlier, the fact that someone's going to spend 12 billion rather than 15 billion, it doesn't mean that that drop-off is going to come specifically out of the UK. In fact, it means that they want to ensure that the content they are shooting is shot somewhere that they can trust. They want to shoot in trusted locations. They want to shoot in in countries that they know can deliver on the content, the premium level that they want. I know that there is that demand. We just don't necessarily have the right supply at the moment in this country. It's an amazing vision and best of luck with it. How far have you got then? Where are we now in, in this whole process? Yeah, we're quite far down the line. We have the land. The planning application went in last year. We're expecting to see that come through in March-ish. The private part of the finance, uh, our partners are Kane International, who are major global developers uh, involved in the Shinfield site. And the private piece of the finance is taken care of by them. The important piece that is still outstanding is the government portion of uh, what we're looking for for this for this facility and that's not an investment into the infrastructure effectively we're taking the risk on the build but this is a partnership between private and public in the best way possible in the same way as the northeast last truly exceptional success in this regard is probably nissan in the 80s or the fact that our industry and the build of those studios was based on that partnership with the uk tax credit so this really is very much in the hands of the current government They have an opportunity, I think a once in a generation opportunity, to not only help to regenerate a region which has been poorly underserved for many years, the term levelling up is laughable with regard to the Northeast, let's be clear about it, but they also have an opportunity to ensure that the creative industries in this country are secure for the next generation as well. Because unless they do something ambitious and join us on this plan, then I think it's going to be very hard to ensure that the UK's success we've seen to date in the last decade is replicated in the next. And we have general election in the UK this year. The assumption is, in terms of the opinion polls, that Labour is going to win. Are you having conversations with with shadow ministers at the moment responsible for this? Uh, Presumably you must be. The, The direction of travel is looking like it's going to be a Labour government by the end of the year. So there... They may be the ones that are, that are going to be in power when they're making this decision, presumably. Or is it, or you're hoping to get a decision before the Tories are, uh, are out? We are talking to everyone. Sunderland is a you know, Labour stronghold. So, of course, certainly the council and local MPs are mostly Labour. We certainly are talking to all sides about this because it is a play that will benefit whichever party is in power for the next decade and beyond. But in terms of timing, we see the spring statement as being a deadline for this. We've been at this project now for two, three years. We've done everything that we said we would do right from the very start. We've been supported fantastically by Sunderland City Council, as I said. I think at this stage, to hold this together and to deliver to the promises we've made, it needs to happen now. And yes, there could be a new government, but realistically, by the time that they're able to engage, you'd be looking at 2025. And so I think the opportunity is now. And it will benefit, as I said, the long-term future of the country, the long-term future of the creative industries, and whoever is in power should see that as an enormous win. Well, best of luck with it. I mean, it's, it sounds a really exciting project. Coming back to Full Well 73, finally, before we come on to your story of the week and and hero of the week and get in the bit, what's next? What are the new projects that you're working on that you can tell us about? Great question. Um, Well, linking it back to Sunderland, of course, 
Oh, and I, I also saw in the news that you're now a director. Is that right? You're on the board at Sunderland FC? Yes, since October. I'm absolutely privileged to have been asked to join the board, which seems completely surreal. More surreal than anything else I've ever been involved in. The idea that, that I'm, I'm actually officially involved in the club that I grew up supporting and love is very strange indeed. Yeah. What's next for, for World 73 then? Well, let's keep it on Sunderland. I mean, there's all kinds of, well, we've said it, Sunderland Till I Die Season 3, the final instalment of the series of the show will be out soon. I'm not entirely sure exactly when, but certainly in the next few months. And that's that feels incredibly prescient in a number of ways. With all of the talk around the studios, with all of the talk around the work that we're doing in the Northeast, to be able to square the circle of a show that I am most proud of, alongside Stephen Fry's alternative Christmas message. <laughs> Very different, but... These two are, are the two pieces of work that I've personally been involved in that I'm most proud of. To get the opportunity to tell the story of the city and the region that I grew up in and that I love, of the football club, of the people, was an incredible privilege. To be able to tell the last segment of that story and to leave it on a high with success, the final season is around the win in the playoffs, out of League One into the championship, it feels like the perfect full stop on that journey. So that, that's the one that I'm, I'm personally most excited to have out in the world. And now it's time for Story of the Week, where my guests get to pick the recent TV or content industry news story that's caught their eye in the past seven days. Leo, what's your Story of the Week? Well, I'm really sorry to come and, and, and ruin the title of the segment, but the story I really wanted to touch on was actually one that took place in late November, early December. And the reason why I think it, it got lost in the noise around Christmas to some degree. And it was a little bit of a warning sign. So it's not a hugely positive one, but I'm going to end with a positive angle. So uh, late November, early December, Amazon Studios, they came out in the press and they said to the UK government that we were at risk of losing the huge amount of investment that was coming in from major streamers and studios shooting in the UK and investing in the UK because the UK government had taken their eye off the ball with how they incentivized and enabled those companies to come over here. Last year, $6.7 billion was spent in this country by those streamers and studios. And I was kind of amazed that, Net, that Amazon sorry, were both so clear in their statement, but also how little this story got picked up. It was a very clear warning. Their quote was along the lines of, the easiest thing in the world is to move production from one territory to another. Now, Amazon spent a couple of million dollars here. I feel like if any other major investor into our country in another industry had come out and said something like this, that people would have been shouting from the rooftops for us to do something about it. And yet the story somehow got lost. So I would just really underline that one and um, a little bit of an appeal to people that it would be a terrible shame and a huge loss to this country if we saw the creative industries hit in this way. So we need to be very cognizant of doing something about that. And now it's time for Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin. So who's your Hero of the Week? It's a collective. I watched Mr. Bates versus the Post Office from Little Gem and ITV Studios. And that collective is my Hero of the Week. I think it's not only an amazing, beautifully crafted, put together piece of television, I also think it's one of the, you know, one of the great examples of the best television that we make in this country. It was incredibly entertaining, incredibly engaging, beautifully acted by Toby Jones and others, but also so important and with an underpinning message. The fact that it has led to potential changes in legislation just in the short time since its release tells you the power that we have within this industry to do good uh, when it's done best. So that collective to me is, is here every week. Yeah. And I saw some new stories over Christmas after it, it started to uh, to go out on ICVX that uh, Toby Jones had actually taken a reduced fee to be able to actually fit within the budget to, to tell this story. So I'm looking forward to having Patrick Spence 
who's who's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks' time to talk about this in in a great deal of detail. So, um, looking forward to that. And then finally, Leo, who or what do you want to tell to get in the bin? Uh, it's a fairly broad one, but I'm going to I'm going to put anti-Semitism in the bin. I'm not sure I need to explain no, why. No. Well, exactly. No, no, I think we all want to put anti-Semitism in the bin. Thank you so much for coming on Telecast, Leo. It's really been a pleasure to have you on the show and talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Best of luck with everything in Sunderland, both the football club and the studio development. We'll be watching on for all of those new developments in IP from your business. So good luck with everything. Thank you, Justin. Best of luck to you too and to Leeds, of course. Thank you very much. No problem. Well, that's all for our first show of 2024. As always, thanks a lot for listening. You can check out edited video versions of our shows on YouTube. Just go to Telecast TV on YouTube and hit subscribe to get all of our forthcoming free video content straight to your feed. Telecast was produced and edited by Spirit Studios and recorded in London. My guest next week is Newtopia boss Jane Root. Until then... A very happy new year and stay safe.